Horton. Dr. Horton, the floor is yours. Great, thanks. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, first, thanks for the invite. Uh, happy to chat with all of you uh, today or tonight. Um, so just a little bit of an overview, um, as was already mentioned, uh, I think the title uh, describes a little bit of, of what I'll be talking about, but just so you know sort of where we're going for the next 40 or so minutes, uh, what I'll be talking about. Um, so we can use this as an opportunity, hopefully tonight, uh, if you're familiar with what radars can do for studying migratory birds, great. If not, I'll try to fill in some of those gaps tonight. Um, so first, radars can detect critical measures of aerial migratory movements. So hopefully you'll be convinced of that um, by the end. Um, artificial lights negatively impact migratory birds. So I'll be talking a little bit about what we've been doing with using radars to hopefully uh, come up with some strategies for mitigating these impacts. And then, uh, let me see, do you see, um, could someone let me know if you see this thing? I see it on my side that says show active speaker video. Do you see that on the screen? No, okay, then it's just, no, it just went away actually, good. Uh, and then third point here, migratory movements are predictable allowing conservation action, alluding to the, the title that was already mentioned. So this is a little bit of our, our roadway for tonight. All righty. Um, okay, so uh, just a little bit of uh, background about myself and where I've been for the last um, maybe decade or so studying migratory birds now. Uh, I did my undergrad in Buffalo, New York at Canisius College, did my uh, degree in biology. Um, I did my master's degree in wildlife ecology at the University of Delaware, and then I transitioned to Norman, Oklahoma to pursue my PhD at the University of Oklahoma. Um, and then from there, I did a, a two-year postdoc at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And then just about two, two and a half years ago, um, I joined the uh, department here at, at CSU in Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of background of, of where I've been and where I've been doing some of the work uh, that I'll be presenting tonight. Okay, so just to back up, thinking about how my lab studies migratory birds. Um, I would say classically for the last, you know, 50, 100, 150 years or so, um, we think about migratory birds and the way we often, are the, the limitations of some of our tools, we, we tend to think about them when they're on the ground. Um, so maybe we're putting up mist nets to ban birds. We're putting loggers on birds when they're on the ground. So we have to capture them. Uh, and a lot of our insights come from terrestrial landscapes, basically. Um, or maybe on the other side, uh, thinking about shorebirds or waterfowl and thinking about an aquatic side of things. Um, for the last, you know, I would say 10 years, we've been thinking about migratory birds in a little bit different space and specifically thinking about aerial spaces as a habitat that migratory birds are utilizing. Um, so we study this, the study of aerial habitats, and we call this aeroecology. So that's the primary theme of my lab. It's not exclusively to say that we only study air spaces, um, but it's a central theme of how we're trying to understand migratory birds and the tools, um, or at least the few tools that we have at our disposal to learn insights of how migrants are utilizing air spaces. This probably isn't terribly surprising to this community here. Um, as bird watchers, you tend to know where and when the birds are on the move. Um, and if it's not, um, the vast majority of migrants that are gonna be moving through North America are moving largely under the cover of darkness. Um, and the exact numbers of, of those flights night to night are gonna be driven by things like time of year, spring and fall. And then on night to night, we might be thinking about atmospheric conditions being central drivers to those, those differences of a lot of migrants moving or few migrants moving on a different night. And I'll get to that um, when we start talking a little bit about uh, migration forecasting. Okay, so just to back up, um, you know, of the 10,000 plus species globally, um, about 19% of all bird species are considered migratory. In North America, when we think about, is this a migrant, not a migrant, 
Um, that percent's a, a good bit higher for obvious reasons that um, we live in a temperate climate. Uh, winter is going to be harsh for some of these birds that are going to be eating insects during the summer. So they have to uh, head south uh, during the winter and find uh, forage elsewhere. Um, so many of our species are considered migratory. About 70% of those birds, or at least the species, terrestrial species in North America, are migratory. And then if we take that 70% of species in North America and we say, do those migrate during the day or do they migrate at night? Um, we see that about 80% of the migratory species in North America are moving under the cover of darkness. So that fact alone creates a, a number of challenges uh, just from a methodology standpoint. Um, we can't really see the birds flying. Uh, we can vaguely hear them through things like flight calls, uh, but on large scales, uh, we don't have a ton of tools to quantify their movements. Um, and the tool that uh, my lab uses is primarily using radar data. So you might be thinking, okay, I've got some sense of a, what a radar is. Um, hopefully this, this visualizes what a radar actually is. And so and this is a NEXRAD radar here. This is the one up in, uh, up in Wyoming, uh, just across the border here. Um, so you've probably have heard of these radars or seen these, you know, floating golf balls on the horizon as you pass an airport, um, you know, see it on the side of the road type of thing. Um, the radars that we use are within the NEXRAD system. So I'll go through a number of the names here. So NEXRAD meaning Next Generation Radar, just an acronym here. Radar itself is an acronym. Um, the model of these radars are WSR-88D. So that, again, just breaks out into weather surveillance radar. It, they were engineered in 1988. They weren't necessarily deployed then. It took a few uh, additional years to start getting a network across the US. And then the D component on these models is at this stage, a Doppler capacity was new to the US's uh, radar network. So you might think of uh, or have heard this on the Weather Channel, thinking about Doppler radar. Again, those same principles are going to be the radars that we're utilizing not to study weather, but to study migratory birds. Uh, across the US in the lower 48, there's 143 of these radar stations. They've been spinning, collecting data every five and 10 minutes um, for the last, in some areas, 25 plus years at this point. Um, the data are freely accessible, which is great for us. We can go and download data from 1995 or 2015 or 10 minutes ago, basically. Um, there's uh, additional radars outside of the lower 48 states. There's one in Puerto Rico. There's seven in Alaska. Um, there's two in South Korea, four in Hawaii, one in Japan that the U.S. operates. Um, and there's one in Guam. We've done some studies in, in a few of these additional areas like Alaska, for instance. So hopefully this gives you a good indication of, of where the, the US's radars, at least weather radars are sprinkled across the US and now globally. Okay, so uh, thinking about the, the radar, the radars are collecting these data, they're sending out radiation, it's bouncing off of stuff in the atmosphere. What does that actually look like visually? So I wanna give you um, some understanding of this and I'll use this uh, nice example here. Um, these are scans that I downloaded for the night of April 23rd and for 2020. So peak spring migration uh, in Southern Florida. So just to orient, there's a white dot in the middle of the slide here. That white dot is where the next red radar is. This is KBYX. Um, this is a radar out in Key West. Um, so what we're going to see is the sun's going to set, and then we're going to see a flush of birds leaving the islands of, of Key West Islands here. Um, and then you're going to see a secondary wave of migrants uh, taking off from Cuba, moving into the airspaces, um, coming past Florida, and eventually making landfall on the mainland of Florida. So I'll just start that video, and we can loop through that a few times. So here's the radar again, and then you'll see the migrants lifting off, a flood of migrants uh, coming through. So you, you can see a couple of things. You'll see pockets of precipitation here. Those are the more intense readings here. Those are gonna be in the, the reds, yellows, and oranges are gonna be rain droplets. 
Um, and then this light blue uh, green colors are largely nocturnal migrants moving through under the cover of darkness. One of the limitations of these radar data is that they don't necessarily tell us anything about species composition. It's not to say that we don't know anything about the species composition, uh, but we don't know anything from the radar's perspective. So on a given night in Florida, we should be expecting probably many different warbler species, uh, maybe some sparrows, um, but it's probably getting a little late in the season for most sparrows. Um, thrushes, vireos, uh, flycatchers coming through the airspaces here. Uh, and this isn't a few birds, it's, it's many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and then some nights, millions of birds coming through the airspaces. So again, this is just one of the sites in the lower 48. Uh, so we have this network, network here of 143 stations. So we get similar data uh, coming in every five and 10 minutes at all of these sites. And the data that you might see on the Weather Channel might look something like this, a mosaic of all of the imagery here. Uh, and what's showing up here is, is largely weather phenomena, rain, you know, thunderstorms, uh, precipitation events um, showing up here. And then behind the scenes, the raw data looks something like this all that stuff that just populated is primarily migratory birds. There are some exceptions. There's, there's likely to be some bats in here, uh, some insects flying at night, but the dominant signal from the biological standpoint is migratory birds. So this is one snapshot from April 5th, uh, 2019. And we can look at these data for you know, lots of nights. Uh, we can look at it across seasons. In decades now, we have um, pretty robust access to these data uh, and abilities to download them and process them. Um, so I'm just going to take a quick uh, snapshot here. We'll look at um, a spring migratory season, and we'll look at events coming in uh, basically every hour for, I think, maybe two or so weeks. Um, so I'll start that up, and we can start to see the interactions of birds, the blooms of birds taking off each night. Uh, the interactions of those blooms of birds with weather events. So weather events usually will shut down migration, but sometimes as they pass, you'll get migrants picking up just behind a weather event, like a precipitation event. Um, so I'll just cue this up and you can see the speeding through. I apologize if it's choppy on your end. Given, given the Zoom virtual setting here. Um, but again, you can see some spatial differences here. Some areas get pretty intense migration on a given night, others do not. Um, some of that's geography, some of that's atmospheric conditions, some of that's just timing of the season as the migrants progress in this season northward uh, as they start to settle into their breeding locations. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a good indication of what the date, the raw data look like. Uh, we process these pretty extensively now. Uh, we have tools to go through, um, identify where all the pockets of rain are, for instance, uh, remove those, and then maintain a biological signal, and that biological signal being related to migratory birds. Um, but we also know the reality that, you know, as these migrants traverse north and south, depending on the season, they're not really moving across a landscape that's just pure darkness, right? That's not the case uh, basically anywhere in the world now, uh, but especially not in parts of the US where uh, the nighttime sky is, is heavily photo polluted uh, by artificial lights. Um, so these migrants are contending with that as well. And we can start to talk about this uh, tonight uh, of how migrants are truly affected by light pollution. Um, so I'll just show one more um, visualization of these radar data, but not looking at a specific year. Um, so not looking at the night of April 25th, 2019, for instance, but looking at what is the general pattern of migration across North America or the US uh, for the last 20 plus years, assembling lots of radar data. Um, and this will give you an annual depiction of 
uh, migration. And this will make sense in just a second. Um, so we'll start on January 1, we'll look at the intensity, and then we'll see migrants pick up in the spring, uh, start heading north, and you'll see the arrows dancing around. That's uh, information we get from that Doppler component of the radar, giving us speed and direction of the migrant passage. Uh, and then we'll see all the arrows flip around as the migrants start heading south uh, during the fall migration. So I'll let this pass through a couple times. And here you'll note uh, we just passed through spring migration, we're coming back in fall migration. You can see some of the spatial differences, both in intensity of where migrants are coming through spring and fall. Um, and you can see, we'll go loop again. Uh, the window of really intense migration through North America is up and down the central flyway in the spring. Um, many of the birds coming through you know, the corridor of Texas as they, they make landfall heading north, and then the distribution of migrants in the fall is much more spread out. There's considerably more birds in the fall, given net productivity, breeding uh, success, um, but that productivity is spread out uh, to a much larger spatial extent. Okay, so let's just start with thinking about light pollution and the interaction of these migrants as they go through the nighttime sky. And we're gonna start here uh, in this region of the country, um, thinking about New York City. Um, so we know migrants utilize urban spaces. So, you know, uh, if you're a birder, you, you probably have heard many great things about birding in Central Park spring and fall and seeing the myriad of warbler species that the eastern half of the US would get uh, during that season. Um, so it's not to say that these migrants completely avoid urban landscapes. They utilize what they have, and in this case, they have some natural habitat in places like Central Park. Um, but as we already mentioned, the birds don't arrive into Central Park when it looks something like this from the airspace, but rather likely something like this, a heavy photo polluted New York City skyline. Um, and one night out of the year, that skyline's even further photo polluted. This will make sense, I think, in just a second. Um, so this is a time lapse I took now a, a handful of years ago or thereabouts. Um, so as the sun's setting here, you can start to see the structure of this light source. Uh, and this light source is one of the towers of light for the September 11th uh, memorial. So um, remembering the lives lost uh, during those terrorist attacks in 2001. Um, so this light structure looks something like this, where we have two towers of light. Each tower is made up of uh, 44 individual spotlights that shine skyward, um, pointed vertically. Um, and those lights can cast sometimes in a clear night up to four miles into the airspace, and they can be seen 60 plus miles away from the actual point of origin. Um, so this is a really intense light source. Um, and a question we had is, is what is the impact on these migratory birds? Um, and this is a video I took. I'm sitting directly in the middle of one of the towers of light, and I'm looking straight up into the airspace. Um, and you're going to see some speckles on this image here already. I'll animate it in just a second. Those speckles uh, at first uh, pass look like insects. Um, I will assure you there are, there are some insects here, but the vast majority of what you'll be seeing here is wood warblers. Um, so things like northern perula, American red start, some yellow warblers uh, moving around in the lights here. Um, so it's, it's not just a few birds, but you can easily count many hundreds in here. Um, and we quickly, you know, came to realize that the strong magnetic attraction to this light source, um, basically since this light source started uh, in the early 2000s. Um, but not all was lost on this. Um, so, you know, no one wanted to see hundreds, thousands of dead birds at this site. Um, so we do pretty intensive monitoring through the entirety of the night when these lights are on. Um, and when we visually detect a thousand birds circling through the lights, the lights are turned off for 20 minutes. And that 20 minute turnoff is enough to allow the birds to clear out 
and head south on their, their fall migration journey for that specific night. And then the cycle might start again that we get a new wave of migrants coming into the light source. Um, so the challenge here is that it's hard to count these birds as they come in and out of the light and get some objective measure of truly how many birds are being drawn to the lights on this specific night. So this is where some of the radar data come into play. Um, so just to orient you, uh, this is a radar uh, snapshot. You can see uh, lower Manhattan here, the Tribute and Light uh, is just at the southern end of Manhattan. And this is a radar snapshot from September 11th, 2015 at 10, 12 p.m. local time. And we estimate in this image here, there's around 500 birds surrounding the Tribute and Light. And in this case, the Tribute and Light is actually turned off. Um, so 500 birds is probably the baseline of just a really uh, good night of migration. 20 minutes later, the Tribute and Light is turned on and we get a new fresh batch of radar data. And this is what this image looks like. Um, so with the lights on and just 20 minutes later, we're estimating just under 16,000 birds now surrounding the Tribute and Light. Um, so this near magnetic pull of these, these migrants off their course into the light source and the surrounding light source. So visually, we could never have estimated this number otherwise. Um, and it's the power of these radar data and this remote sensing technology um, that really, um, in, in no ways using the pun here, illuminates what's going on there. Um, so this is just, again, one example of an on-off um, what we observed uh, in this study that we did uh, some years ago now was to look at this across uh, a number of nights, and a number of nights equates to multiple years. So seven years of data equates to seven nights because this is on just one night of the year. Uh, we estimated around 1.1 million birds coming in and out of the lights uh, with these transitions, so a pretty large impact. Uh, but with the on-off periodicity here, uh, we don't actually see much bird mortality and that's that's great. Um, so it's, it's showing that the lights off truly does work in this capacity. Um, so as a next step here, we thought, okay, that light source is, is quite unique. There's basically nothing like it um, across the US. Maybe some spots of Las Vegas have this, um, but otherwise this is pretty unique and doesn't generalize to normal light pollution on a given night. So we took a step back and said, okay, um, is New York City maybe the worst offender of, of light pollution and how many migrants come over in New York City? So could we say that New York is maybe exposing the most number of migrants to light pollution? But we also knew that there's, there's a number of factors there. So you could have a very bright city and just have a lot of birds coming over it, or you could have a very bright city and not many birds pass over that city given its geography, for instance. So that was our starting point. And we did this in New York City, but also uh, the next 124 largest US cities. So in total 125 cities we looked at um, to see if we could come up with a catalog of um, what are the great, what cities are the greatest threats to migratory birds in terms of solely light pollution. And it's, probably quite obvious of why we're looking at cities in this capacity, but I'll, I'll re-emphasize that point. Um, the top 125 largest cities in the lower 48 account for just 2.1% of the total land mass of the, the lower 48. Um, but when we look at light pollution or the luminance that comes off of these specific areas, they account for around 35% of all light pollution. So it's, it's quite disproportionate in terms of their footprint footprint geographically to their footprint uh, on light pollution. Um, so the long story short here, I'll just give you um, the results here. But before I show this plot or the data in it, I want to orient you to the axes here. So on the y-axis going up and down here, we're going to have spring ranks of all of those 125 largest cities. And then on the x-axis going left to right, we'll have a fall rank. 
Um, so that is, we've got 125 cities and we wanna say number one is the worst offender for light pollution and number of migrants that come through. Number 125 is the lowest on that scale. And to orient you on these axes, if something's in the bottom left corner, that's on the low end of the ranking. If something's in the top right corner of this plot, that's high on this scale, exposing a lot of birds to light pollution. So this is the way the data shake out uh, for the 125 largest cities. To orient you to these points, the points themselves represent one city and they're shaded to their mean light radiance. So the warmer that color, the yellow is a brighter city and the size of that dot is scaled to the, the footprint, geographic footprint of that city. So on this plot here, New York City would be the largest disc because it's the largest US city. Um, and the brightest dot here would be Las Vegas, followed by New Orleans here being the second brightest city. Um, and again, the way we're doing this is we're taking radar data to measure how many birds are flying over that city. And then we're measuring light pollution and we're taking the simple product of those two things to say, okay, a lot of birds fly over and this is a bright city. So that's gonna be our metric. So this is where some Colorado uh, cities fall on this, uh, Denver and Colorado Springs, uh, in terms of those are the, the two cities in Colorado that met the criteria for being within the 125 largest cities. And then if something fell below the one-to-one -one line here uh, versus spring and fall, that tells us that the ranking for those specific cities if it's below, it's higher during the fall. And if it's above this line, it's higher for the spring. You can see a, a common trend of the cities that are higher in the spring are all Western uh, cities here on the West Coast. Um, and there's various reasons for that. We get some looped patterns of migration across spring and fall. That's basically telling us it's not true that uh, any uh, one species or migrants just simply go up and down a flyway, but sometimes they go up one flyway and come back a different flyway, uh, having a looped pattern. Uh, and we could talk more about that later on if there's any questions. Um, so I wanna zoom into just the top uh, section here, because if we were going to make an impact on reducing light pollution, these cities in the top here would give us the, the biggest bang for our buck, basically. And regardless of season, it was Chicago, Houston, and Dallas being number one, two, and three, and that didn't waver. You can see where uh, some other large notable cities uh, reside on this ranking as well. So we've done some work in Chicago, and I just wanna reemphasize that if we're turning off lights, this can have a really positive impact, right? We saw this with the Tribute and Light in New York City. The thing that we're concerned about is fatal collisions with buildings in correspondence to light pollution. So some work in Chicago has really uh, brought this together in a very concrete way at a single location. So I'll start here in Chicago. So Chicago, a very bright city, uh, sits in a very unique geographic location sitting along Lake Michigan, a lot of migrants coming through this area. So the threat um, to our nocturnal migrants is quite high. Um, one of our study here starts um, in Chicago. So if we zoom in, I'll get to where specifically we were focused on. You can see this coral reddish colored uh, highlighted building here. This is McCormick Place Convention Center and that's where our study took place. And this is what it looks like um, from the lakefront view, basically. So McCormick Place is a large convention center, uh, but it's a fairly low rise building, only about three stories high. Um, and over uh, a 43 year period of collecting bird carcasses daily, um, there have been over 40,000 birds collected. Um, so collections occur daily, spring and fall. Um, and at the single site, nearly 40, more than 40,000 birds have now collided. Um, so what we're interested in is saying, okay, what are the drivers of this? Um, long and short of that is that when there's more birds in the airspace as measured by radar, we see more collisions. When there's specific atmospheric conditions or visibility issues, we see more collisions. Um, but in relation to light pollution, we saw something quite interesting as well. 
Um, the uniqueness of this study was that the folks that were collecting the carcasses in the morning um, also were measuring how many bays of the windows were lit on McCormick Place. So this one was lit, this one was not. And that those data we have um, for a, a little bit shorter period, around 20 years, those data have been collected. And what we found with modeling that relationship is that having the illuminated window area on McCormick Place decreased collision counts by 11 times in the spring and six times in the fall. So turning off the lights, interior lights in this case, dramatically decreased or could decrease uh, collisions. Um, so that was really important to really bring that home. Okay, so just getting back to uh, a little bit of the radar data and then transitioning, how do, we, how do we use these data to now make a forecast, hopefully to reduce collisions into the future? So this is going to be a time series for the Denver radar for 2018. And we can see some of the, the periodicity here. So March into April, we're not getting a lot of activity on the radar of, of nocturnal migrants. And then we go into late April, early May, we're getting these big bursts of migration. And spatially, it might look something like this. Um, these being the nights, this is what a radar image might look like on the low end. And then on our peak night, something like this. So of um, the really big nights here, uh, just three nights account for 50% of the passage um, through the Denver area. Um, there was a question of why birds are attracted to light. Um, I can go into a little bit more detail um, probably at the back end of the talk, but the short answer is we don't actually know why migrants are attracted to light. So a very unsatisfying answer to that question, but a really good question to ask and an obvious one to ask too. Um, okay, so back to this time series here. Um, we can see that we've got three nights. Those are really important nights for the passage of migrants, and those nights occur around uh, in an interval here of you know just under three weeks, basically. Okay, so that same pattern generally holds across the U.S. Um, so if we rank all the nights per station per season, um, we see that the top ten percent of nights at each radar station account for just over 50% of all of the activity. So on a seasonal basis, uh, the top 10% of nights basically equates to around 10 nights of um, migration are going to account for more than half of all of the activity that will pass in any given area of the country. Those nights are gonna be you know, variable by you know, if you're north or south, uh, east or west, um, but regardless, it's around 10 really important nights per station. So that, that's an interesting fact there that we see that in the data. So if we could target those nights and turn off lights on those nights, that would be important. Sorry, this is uh, going again. Um, so we need to accurately identify a small portion of nights that are particularly important for migration. This is challenging because we're trying to confidently predict the rare event, basically. So some approaches to lights out, uh, I'll go through this quickly for the sake of time, um, but some approaches to light might, turning off lights at any given area might be something like this. Turn off your lights during a period of time, and that period of time would be defined by an that's an intense, historically an intense window of time when most migrants will pass through a given area. So for Denver, and these, these dates are specific uh, to Denver in this example. So Denver, we're gonna tell, out, uh, tell downtown Denver to turn off their lights from May 4th to May 18th. And that's gonna be the same every spring going forward because that's what we learned from looking at 25 years of radar data. Uh, and we could call this, you know, fix selection, for instance. Um, or we could be a little bit more dynamic with it to say, turn off lights on specific nights that of high activity that we're predicting, we're forecasting these nights. Um, so for example, Denver follows a forecast of alerts. They turn off their lights on April 28th, the night of May 1st, May, 1st, May 3rd, May 4th, May 8th, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's gonna be different every single spring season because it's truly a forecast driven by dynamic uh, atmospheric conditions. And we'll call this dynamic selection. Okay, 
So we ran, we crunched all the numbers because we can look into the history of uh, the radar data. Uh, and we can say, okay, you know, how many nights is it gonna take to do dynamic selection? How many nights is it going to take to do fixed selection? All on the assumption that we're trying to do some action that predicts 50% of migrants passing through each radar station. So in the spring, it's going to take about 10 nights of forecasted alerts to capture 50% of migrants coming through. For fixed selection, that's going to be about 19 nights. So it's, it's higher because we're getting the intense nights and uh, some nights that might not be so intense because the window is fixed. We get the highs and the lows because there's periodicity night to night. In autumn, same thing holds true for this dynamic approach. It's going to take about 11 uh, forecasted alerts or 11 specific nights. Um, from the fixed selection, it's considerably longer. So basically what we would be saying is turn off your lights for the next month. Um, and that's going to be a fixed interval. So 26.5 uh, nights, we're going to have to turn off the lights for a, a period of time. So that's probably not super uh, compelling to maybe a, a business manager that wants their lights on to attract attention to uh, their store, for instance, or put up an advertisement. Okay, so how do we create these alerts? Um, this is, you know, has been a challenge for a while, and we, we came up with a system um, a couple of years ago now. Um, some, some of you might be familiar with this program called BirdCast. So you can go to birdcast.info. And in spring and fall, you can view our bird migration forecast. So it's a program that's run between the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, my lab at CSU, and the University of Massachusetts. So our approach to this is to use radar data, no surprise, uh, as the backbone to this forecast model. So we use these radar data to quantify bird migration, and then we link those data with atmospheric conditions things like app, uh, air temperature, wind speed, and direction, and a whole slew of other factors that we've seen a lot of evidence in the literature from past studies. These are central drivers to what promotes a bird to head north or south, depending on the season, or it shuts down bird migration in spring or fall on a given night. So this is just a workflow of what we've been doing. So we link all of these radar data night after night after night with atmospheric conditions. And then we learn those associations. You know, this wind speed in this area promotes bird migration as measured by the radar, for instance. So we learn those associations. And once we have a good model, then we just add in new data on a nightly basis. So to say, we can grab what the atmosphere looks like tonight, and then say, this is the prediction of what birds should be doing given the atmosphere. And this is what this would look like, is a migration forecast, not a weather forecast, but an indication of where we expect migrants to be taking off and flying um, on a given night. So this is one forecast. This is for the night of April 26, 2016. Um, and just to paint the picture here, uh, warmer colors, more migrants are predicted to be flying. And our prediction is three hours after local sunset across the entirety of the US. That's how we standardize our maps. Um, and in this map here, uh, we removed all of the data uh, in our model from 2016 and then made a prediction for this specific night for 2016. So the model has no clue what is going on in 2016 in this case. And this is what the radar radars actually measured. So we had a prediction, and now we're overlaying what the radars actually measured on this night. So hopefully you can see the correspondence. Um, you know, I could have cherry picked any example and probably convinced you that it works, um, but that's not very objective. So this is the objective side of uh, model performance here. We did that process that I just explained on the previous slide, but we iterated it many times over through seasons and multiple years. So for 2017, holding out all of those data, making predictions relating it to the truth, we explain around 78% of all of the variation in the data set. So biologically, this is quite high in the scale. The scale ranges from zero to one, one being perfect predictions, zero meaning you do no better than chance uh, at making a prediction. And we're considerably high uh, on the scale. So these are quite good models. 
And we see this consistent performance across uh, multiple years here, 20 plus years of data. So that's really exciting. Um, so back to uh, our lights out strategy here. So in practice, again, we're gonna make forecasts and those forecasts are going to have error in them. We don't get it right every single night as we just saw in the previous slide. So in practice, uh, our forecasts are going to make alerts to say, turn off your lights. That meaning this is a night that's gonna account for you know, some contribution towards that 50%. And in practice, we're gonna make around 14 lights out alerts at every station across the US in the spring. That's about four nights of false positives, um, but it's still considerably less than that fixed approach of just saying, turn off your lights for 19 nights. In autumn, we have uh, a little bit more error in our model, and we're saying around six additional nights um, uh, relative to the, the perfect uh, scenario. But that is also still considerably better than saying, turn off your lights for the next 26.5 nights. So following um, these forecasts is a better strategy at all of the radar stations that we have. Um, so again, following forecasts requires fewer nights of action to capture 50% of activity. Um, so this is a good use of, of ecological models in this sense. So uh, when uh, we're in a migration season, so the next go round of this will be basically March 1st, we'll turn on our forecast again, and you'll start getting uh, migration um, intensity maps, uh, and you'll get lights out maps as well. And that would look something like this. So this is an example from the, this past fall season uh, for the night of September 14th, 2001, uh, 2021. Um, we're estimating on this night 373 million birds in the airspace. Um, and then we also convert this into a lights out map. And you can see all of the areas in red are locally intense migration. Um, and that contrast is important because the intensity of migration is not equally distributed across the entirety of the US. Texas is going to get more migrants than Colorado is going to get. So those states require different thresholds of what's an important night for that geography. Um, so we make uh, four oh, hold quick. We've got yep. a question that's very relevant, which is, sure. um, are certain cities actually using these forecasts for lights out campaigns? And if so, how are those initiatives organized? Yeah, so um, we promote the lights out alerts um, the best we can uh, through various social media uh, campaigns. There's email alerts that send these out, um, but we don't know of any specific city um, that is use, using them as a, as a blanket thing following the forecasted alerts. Uh, we have cities in Texas that follow that static approach that I was just mentioning, turn off the lights for two weeks in spring, turn off the lights for three weeks in fall, for instance. Um, so in cities like Dallas, Houston, uh, Austin, Texas, San Antonio, um, there are proclamations that their mayors basically put out. Um, so government buildings will go dark for a two to three week periods, in essence, just for migratory birds. Um, so there is some buy-in uh, thus far, but to my knowledge, it has just been localized to Texas. Um, because we've we've put a lot of uh, effort and time into that area because there were a lot of cities uh, that ranked highly uh, from our, our previous list. So hopefully that fills in that question a little bit. Um, okay, I'm almost done, so I'll get right to the questions uh, in just a second if there's more. I see there's a few in there, I think. Okay, so we make forecasts uh, one, two, and three days in advance during spring and fall seasons, and you can see those. And you can also drill into specific states. Um, I make all these state-specific maps available on my lab's website at the aeroecolab.com. Um, and you can see how many birds might be flying over specific cities. Forecasted birds would be flying over specific cities of Colorado, or if you want to drill into New York or Wisconsin, you pick your state. Uh, you can see what's going on at the state level or a city specific level. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm going to stop there with not doing next steps. I'm going to skip um, to just a couple of quick slides. Um, here's my acknowledgments. Um, uh, lots of 
of folks have worked on this over um, the number of years who have been tackling questions like this. Uh, I'll acknowledge my funding sources here, and then I'd be happy to take questions. Um, and if there's other questions that of, of the things I didn't cover, uh, we can go back on some of the slides I skipped, um, but it looks like we're pushing up against the hour and I don't wanna hold people. So I'm gonna stop there and um, look at the questions now. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Um, if there are any questions that you want to put into the chat window, you can feel free to do that now. If anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, uh, the best way to do that so we can be organized is use the raise hand feature, which is in the reactions um, on the bottom bar of your Zoom controls. There's a little reactions happy face with a little plus next to it. If you click on that, inside of that, the lowest button on there should say raise hand. If you click that raise hand button, that'll get you in line for asking questions. Kyle, I believe you can read the chat window. Uh, yeah, so one was, you see fit. yep, uh, one was from Nick. I, I can probably just launch through these quickly. Uh, one was from Nick, it says, uh, he said, uh, how accurate are the birdcast forecasts? Um, so that was in many ways, uh, one of the slides that I was talking about um, where we're, you know, how much variance are we explaining? So um, the, the forecasts are quite accurate. One thing that we struggle with is getting, um, we can say that this is a really intense night of migration um, and we can categorize it that way, but sometimes we're actually off on the highest ends of migration. It's really hard to get the difference between um, at a U.S. scale, 600 million birds versus 800 million birds. 200 million birds is a ton of birds, um, but from a modeling standpoint, it doesn't look terribly different to us. It's still a ton of birds, um, and we miss that nuance a little bit. Um, so that's something that we're, we're trying to work on because getting that right is really important, right? Getting the, the most extreme events from migration is really important, uh, and we want to lock onto that a little bit better. Um, we do slightly worse in the fall. There's various reasons for that, but migrants really bottle up with weather events during the fall. They're, they're a bit more choosy. And when they're going to migrate during spring, it seems like a mad dash for these birds that night after night after night, they're migrating. Um, and the, the weather phenomena are a little bit more favorable to head north in the spring versus fall. They're contending with a little bit more adverse weather. Um, so for that reason, our models do perform uh, slightly worse uh, during that season. So can I follow up that question real quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I noticed that looking at your radar points, there there's sort of circles around each one, and so it, it looks to me like that you you must be doing a lot of extrapolation, like between radar stations and and even like birds close to a radar station and far from radar station. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so um, basically the models work in a very uh, coarse way right now. Um, we have 143 radars. It's as if we only have 143 points of data right now. Um, so we, we model onto, we, we use those data to train the model and then we make predictions across the entirety of the US. Uh, and we make pretty coarse predictions right now. Um, the pixels themselves that we are predicting on are very large. Uh, and then we smooth it out. And that's why those maps look so smooth. So um, the next phase, and this might be the follow on to one of the questions, what are the next steps? The next step is to enhance that resolution considerably um, because the training data that we're using right now is 143 points. From the radar perspective, there are tens of millions of points in the actual raw data. And we can learn those associations not to say, this is what uh, migration looks like for Colorado, but this is what migration looks like for this patch, this urban park. This is how many birds might be lifting off from this green space and not from this urban space. Um, so those are the next steps uh, from the, the sort of nuts and bolts of these models that we're, we're hoping to achieve and have started already. Um, that'll keep us busy for the next probably year or so. Um, and I would expect, you know, version 2.0 of, of forecasts coming um, maybe by the end of, you know, 2022 is a hope uh, that we get everything rolled out and it starts showing up on BirdCast. Thanks, Nick, for the question. Um, moving down the list, uh, there's also a question from Aaron Sell. 
uh, is there a link to local TV nightly news weather forecasts? Is there some connection is what I'm guessing that question is? Um, yeah, I'll riff on that question if I understand it completely. Um, so we try to get, you know, we, we talk with is basically we'll talk with anyone that's interested in the work. Um, and that sometimes includes uh, folks from news outlets to meteorologists. Um, last season, um, we had some connections of trying to make the data accessible to TV meteorologists. So they don't want to put up uh, uh, an image that's on BirdCast, but they want to bring in their own data, our data, and plot them in their software suite, the suite that they're using to show you on TV. Um, so we're, we're trying to make that accessible that they could go in as they want, download those data for their format or what they hope to be that format, and then ingest it the way they, they want it and visualize it the, the way they want it. So they're not dependent on our maps. They can make their own. And that's the hope that they could say, you know, this is the weather at the U.S. scale or this is the weather in Colorado. And, you know, just for those interested, this is what we're, you know, the broadcast team is showing migrants taking off tonight or something like that. Um, so we're trying to get in because that it's all a messaging uh, component here of, of lights out stuff doesn't really happen uh, unless we get buy in and people start knowing that light, you know, disrupts migratory birds. So um, again, that's one of the th things I skipped in the slides is another project that we have of, of trying to get stakeholders involved um, from Audubon groups to ornithology groups to the Park Service to the International Dark Sky Association, bringing all these groups together to talk about light pollution, um, figure out where the gaps are in knowledge, figure out what the public and how they perceive light pollution in the context of migratory birds. Um, so yeah, that it's, it's an interesting and challenging messaging uh, side of this as well. So Kyle, we have a hand up. We also have two more questions in the chat window. Out of respect for your time, is there a, a need for you to, to cut off right now at the eight o'clock hour? No, I'm, I'm, I can go for uh, a number of minutes more if, if folks are interested. Okay, so if anyone does wanna stick around, feel free. If you do not have the, that opportunity, feel free to drop off and know that we do have this uh, recorded and it will be up on our YouTube channel uh, probably by the end of the week. Um, so for those that wanna take off, now's a good opportunity. Um, for those that wanna stay and listen to more questions, Kyle, uh, you can answer either the chat window or Peter Gent has his uh, hand up as well. Peter, go for it if you wanna jump in. So oh, very interesting talk. Um, so do you make the predictions during the day <clears throat> for the night following, or do you make predictions two or three days ahead? Um, I guess both. Um, so we make predictions uh, four times a day. Um, they come in every six hours. We get a new batch of the meteorological forecast, and then we convert them into a bird migration forecast. Um, so all the websites will get four unique predictions every day. Um, and every time we make one prediction, we predict for uh, the night of, and then uh, the night after, and the night after that. So we're always making a, a rolling three-day window of predictions, if that helps. So if you were going to do dynamic forecasting, how long, how much time do you think people need to switch, to make the decision to switch their lights off? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, the forecasts admittedly don't move around too much. Uh, so if we make a three day forecast, it's pretty like, again, the boundaries of an alert might move around subtly. Um, so, you know, meteorologists always get uh, all the flack for their forecasts, right? But they're pretty good, right? There's a lot of science that happens behind forecasts and, you know, three days out um, is still a long time and the forecasts are very good. Uh, we make forecasts into like two weeks. We know that those ones are very unstable that far out. Um, but it's just fun for us to behind the scenes to be looking at things like that. Um, but whether or not someone could turn off their lights, if we said the alert is tonight and it's, you know, 5 PM, maybe that's not a possibility. Um, so we don't, I don't know the answer to the question, but that's our hope of giving that three day buffer that it's coming. And the fact that it's coming is stable, hopefully gives them confidence that, okay, we can plan on this, but I don't know the answer. I haven't had those conversations because we don't have many folks 
that are actually committed to the dynamic approach. We know it's more efficient, but it might not be um, equally as feasible, let's say. It's easy to say, turn off your lights for the next two weeks and don't worry about it. But it's more challenging to say, turn off your lights when we tell you to, and you're gonna have to pay attention to this thing. Uh, I'll do the chat ones and then I'll come back to your question, Nick. Um, Diana wrote in the chat, so do the lights cause the birds to change course of migration or does it uh, cause them to become disoriented? Do we know why it causes fatalities? Um, the last one's probably easier to, uh, do we know why it causes fatalities? Um, the light pollution itself isn't killing birds per se. Um, it's causing them to encounter pretty risky areas. So it's, it's causing them to get disoriented, start circling around a building, for instance, um, and then collide with a, a window. Um, or, you know, you see this a lot on communication towers. They, they circle the tower because of the, the light that's on the tower. And then they collide with the guy wires or the structure itself, and that ultimately kills them. Um, so it, it's causing disorientation primarily. It causes attraction first, and then they, they seem to just incessantly circle around it. They call uh, very frequently, um, and then something happens. They get predated, they collide, um, they just spend a ton of energy circling and calling and that might exhaust them and you know allow them not to proceed on their migration. Um, but that first question of like, well, why are they attracted um, is always the really interesting question, but we don't have a very interesting answer because we don't know. Um, Steven's question here, will the finer resolution predictions be derived from different radar sensors than the 140 stations? Um, no, it'll be the same uh, radars. We'll just use the data. We'll use more of the data, basically. So right now we're aggregating lots of it. Um, we just don't we don't process the data in a very spatially explicit way within the radar. Um, so we'll use the same data, the same radars, um, but we'll just preserve a lot more information to make the finer scale um, forecast and, and train the, the finer scale forecast. Uh, Nick? Are certain species more susceptible to um, to fatality from or interference from light pollution than others? Like, for, for example, do shorebirds also attract? Are they attracted to light? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I would say there are some generalities to this. So the study in Chicago that I alluded to with collisions uh, at McCormick Place at the Convention Center. Um, I don't know the exact percentage, but I, I would say offhand, it's something like. 95% songbirds. Um, very few waterfowl seem to collide with buildings. Um, shorebirds are pretty rare, um, with some exceptions. Woodcocks seem really susceptible to colliding uh, and showing up in urban centers for whatever reason. Um, but you don't hear of like, you know, greater yellow legs or yes, lesser yellow legs. It seems like there's some species within families that, uh, for whatever reason, gravitate towards uh, that disruption. Um, even within warblers, some warblers seem to show up more frequently than others, and some war uh, some sparrows show up more frequently than others. Given you know, thinking about all of the the assemblage that moves through, some just show up higher than others. So here's a quick thought: woodcock, they uh, they um, they what do, what do you call it? They do um, those exhibitions, uh, not exhibitions, but uh, they fly around at night. Mm -hmm. As part of their their courtship, so maybe they're using the stars or the moon for orientation. And and I know insects are attracted to to the moon for for a light uh, for for orient, for uh, d determining the direction of their flight. So maybe that's what's going on. Is it the, the, the birds just think that it's the moon that they're flying? They're trying to fly parallel to the moon, and that makes them go around the light. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, it's an interesting hypothesis, right? I don't, um, I don't have an answer, so I can't say you're right or wrong, uh, but it's a fun idea to think through, right, um, of what all the mechanisms could be. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great idea. Are there any other questions uh, coming from the chat? Anyone want to throw anything in? Anyone want to unmute themselves and, and ask a question? If not, I have questions as a meteorologist, but that's <laughs> maybe a little too deep. I want to hear your question. 
Yeah, I know, Diana. I understand. Um, the the I have two questions, and I will ask them definitely separately. Um, you have that um, the verification that you've done of the um, you said seventy eight uh, percent is your R. Um, what's the verification data set that you're up against? What are you using as verification? Is it actually radar? Is it um, how do you then quantify those to each other? Are you actually making a radar reflectivity or are you generating a bird migration uh, or a bird value that you're then extrapolating from the reflectivity as well? Yeah, that's a good question. So we've done it in a couple of different ways. Um, the way that we've done this is to, so it, it's all based on radar data. There's no, we don't have another US scale, uh, you know, wholly new independent data set that we can verify off of. Um, so again, that might be a little circular in nature, but our approach has been, um, we'll train a model on all the data we have and we'll pull out one year's worth of data. Um, so let's say we have, and this is true of our, our current model that runs, we have 23 years of radar data. We'll hold out one of those years, put that one aside, uh, to verify off of. We'll train the model on 22 years of data. And then what we will do is grab um, the, the, the meteorological forecast. We'll put in, you know, the, the one that we held out will then make predictions onto that year. Um, so we know the truth because the, in this case, the truth is the radar measurement. We're going to say that's the truth that we're trying to model off of. Uh, we're going to make a prediction onto that year, given the atmospheric conditions night after night after night. And then we're going to relate the prediction against the truth being the reflectivity value at that site. Um, so we've done that iterative, like that's how we got the circles of this is what 2017 looks like in 2016 and so on and so forth. Um, we've also done it where um, we've dropped individual stations out of the model. Uh, to try to figure out, is the model better or worse in some parts of the U.S.? And that is definitely true. Um, so, for instance, um, I can't remember all the sites that are not great, but Key West, Florida is not a spot that we make great predictions. Um, and there's probably some, re like, again, there's, we don't know what's happening in Cuba of when the, you know, we don't have any um, memory or knowledge beyond the immediacy of the site. So like that arrival is a little odd uh, or the departure might be a little odd. Um, some of the mountainous sites that get just a lot of clutter, beam blockage, um, we just don't get great measurements admittedly. Uh, also like some of the sites because of where they're placed in high elevation areas don't measure a lot of migration. Uh, so then you're dabbling in like noise, like uh, is it different to have this number of birds versus this when the range is so small? Um, and you have such a big model trying to capture the range in Texas versus you know the range in Utah, which might be very small, and it's within the error probably. So right. So you've I don't touched know if I on your question. You you've touched on that the next question, which is: Are you removing insects, or are you specifically targeting birds by using the velocity and the reflectivity together to to actually pinpoint birds versus insects? Yeah, so we this is uh, we went through this process. This always happens when we write a paper that we get this first question of uh, how do you know those are birds, um, and our methods for this are admittedly rudimentary. Um, we use the speed as a filter. Um, so we our first iteration of our model, we didn't even bother uh, accounting for insects because we were using. Uh, we just thought most of these are are in fact birds. From everything we've done, it, we always felt like this is a lot of birds up here. Um, we went through that and we almost like, again, we got the first question from the reviewer said, how do you know these are birds? So then we went back through the review process. Um, we went through and did a speed filter saying anything below five meters per second airspeed, we're going to say is insects because it's too slow. Uh, anything above that we're going to say is, is bird dominated. Um, again, that was a long process to get that new threshold. Uh, the model basically did not change at all. Um, so it was probably, um, maybe more evidence that most of the intense signals are in fact coming from birds and not insects on that logic. 
Um, but our current model runs off of that filtered data. Uh, so we did move forward with it because it's, it's probably better, or at least logically is better. Um, but the same conditions that promote a bird to fly are likely the same exact conditions that promote an insect to fly um, in terms of efficiency, flight efficiency. Um, so when we get insects, we're probably getting birds on top of those. And we just, you know, the radar um, better than I do, uh, very likely. Um, so it, it's just, you know, we can't disentangle the signal when they're in the same pulse volume. Any other questions while we still have Dr. Horton on the line? I see a bunch of thank yous, by the way, Kyle. Um, Oh, cool. Thanks. Good yeah, thanks everyone for sticking around. Thanks for uh, the questions. questions uh, quick question. Hard. Yeah, sure. Question. So how important do you think the mortality is? I mean, are these birds able to uh, compensate for these population losses by, you know, breeding uh, more frequently? Or, or is this mor mortality a significant part of all migration-related mortality? And, you know, is it really important that we do something about it? Yes, I think it is. Um, so that, that's why I'm maybe so passionate about it. Um, so there's a number of studies. Um, again, we're not saying light, lights are killing these birds, right? But lights are putting them into scenarios that they're likely, more likely to collide or get predated by a cat. Um, so maybe they don't collide with the building, but now they're, they're in downtown uh, Manhattan or they're now in uh, downtown Denver because of the light pollution. And now that's riskier and they can't forage. Um, so collisions alone with uh, windows it accounts for about a, a billion birds dying across the US. So that's just a massive number that cannot be uh, compensated, right? That, that has to be additive mortality that's very likely resulting in, in massive bird declines, migratory bird declines. Um, we can't really measure the impact of, you know, the bird successfully doesn't hit a window, doesn't collide, um, but now it's stuck in a city and it's foraging in suboptimal areas and maybe it never makes it to its final destination because of all of these things contributing and that, that bird doesn't breed. So now we don't, we don't get that production or it didn't get enough energy and it ultimately perished. Like there's, we don't have the tools to measure that, um, but it's likely that these things just keep contributing additively to the bird declines that are uh, so, so rampant across North America at this point. Um, so yeah, I would say, yes, it's important. And I think it is contributing to overall declines. Thank you. Okay, so it doesn't seem like there's any more questions coming in. We've gone uh, 15 minutes approximately over our uh, allotted time. Uh, Let's give a thank you to Dr. Horton once again. Uh, much appreciated thank for your you. time here. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone, I appreciate it. To everyone else, uh, have a good night uh, and enjoy the rest of your evening. See you, everyone. Thank you, Brian, too.